Build Original Series, hosted by Matt Reisinger. Talking Trades, brought to you by Front Door and Sashko. Okay, I think we're live. What's up, my friends? Welcome back to another episode of the Build Show webinar. That's right, something a little different. Uh, we got an hour uh, to spend with you guys today, and of course we're recording this, so I suspect most of you are not watching this live, but we do have some people streaming in on live, and I just realized I need to log in uh, so I could get Q&A on here. So I'm going to do that while I talk in a second, but uh, we're talking trades on this webinar. You know, we launched this amazing series uh, with our four uh, tradesmen and women that are on here today. And let me introduce them just in case you don't know them. Uh, so first off, we'll start with uh, CJ with uh, CNC Electric out in California. CJ, thank you for joining us. You're looking especially good in your black build logo shirt. I think we have the same shirt on today. Looking good. Uh, we also have Eric Ani. Uh, by the way, uh, all four of these folks are on Instagram. You should go follow them as well. Uh, CJ CNC Electric on Instagram. Uh, Eric, if you give us a wave, that's Eric Ani with at Mechanical Hub. Eric's a plumber in um, Minnesota, Elk River specifically. Uh, we've got Lydia Crowder, who's a drywall contractor in outside of Bozeman, Montana, uh, much better known as Drywall Shorty to the world. I suspect most people come up and don't know your first name, Lydia. They call you Drywall Shorty at trade shows because they may not know your first name. Yeah, uh, yeah we, it happens a lot. Is that what normally happens? I suspect that might happen. And then Zach Detmore. Yeah, yeah, not a lot of people. They don't know your real name, do they, Lydia? Yeah. I, I'll, I'll admit when I first met you, I didn't know your first name either for a, for a hot minute there or so. <laughs> and then we've got Zach Detmore, uh, who's known as Detmore101 on the Instagrams. And so we did this amazing series called Talking Trades, and we're actually still finishing it with it. Uh, I believe we've got two episodes of Zach published. Everyone else has been published so far. Uh, but what we're going to do today is basically a condensed version of that. We're going to talk through some updates. And my hope is that if you're watching this, especially if you're watching this pre-recorded, you might sit down on the couch with your 10-year-olds, with your 12-year-olds, uh, with your teenagers to get some advice from these adults that were in their shoes uh, prior and learn what they've done to get into the trades and how they've taken uh, this amazing education, some of them from trade schools, some of them on the job site, and turn it into a career without necessarily having to get a college degree. Uh, so with that being said, before we jump into that, I'm curious uh, from the four of you, have any of you gotten any feedback from random folks out there uh, about the series? Uh, yeah, Matt. So I was actually stopped at the grocery store recently by somebody in the community said, hey, saw you on the build show learned all about your business and we're watching the other episodes. I think there's a drywaller on there now. Something like that it was really cool. <laughs> and it was just really neat to run into somebody in my own town that recognized me. Probably wouldn't have otherwise. That's so cool, Eric. I love it, man. Uh, I'm curious also from the four of you, are there any updates uh, since the filming? You know, some of you guys, like Lydia, you and I filmed actually almost a year ago at this point. It was last summer time when we filmed. Uh, any big changes to life or your businesses or the, or your trade uh, since we filmed together on that series? Uh, no changes for me. Everything's just been staying busy. I actually worked this morning, got up, um, went and textured a um, duplex unit and then came home by noon, got cleaned up because I didn't think everybody probably wanted to look at me with drywall mud and dust all over my face and then jumped on the webinar. So um, just staying busy. We were staying really busy. I loved the comments that I saw, uh, Lydia, about how dirty I got uh, yes. working with you and how everyone, I, I heard several people, both in my office and around job sites and on comments, saying something to the effect of, oh, you thought it was going to be easy what Lydia does, right? Doesn't she make it look so easy on her uh, her short videos that she makes? And, and I kind of did one of those, yeah, to be honest, I kind of did think I would be better at it. <laughs> And I was. Yeah. Well, it's, it's one of those traits. When you're really good at it, you make it like incredibly simple. And then somebody who has no experience jumps in and they're like, why do I suck at this so much? And it's really, it's one of those ones that looks so fun, but it can also be incredibly frustrating. And it takes a long time to get good at it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know what? I forgot to mention the top of the hour, by the way. Uh, this series was made possible by our friends at Sashko. 
and Front Door. So a big shout out to those guys. Uh, two fantastic companies that have been Build Show supporters for a long time. We're going to talk a little bit about them at the end. And by the way, if you are watching this on the live version, it looks like we've got about 100 people on the line. Uh, go to the Q&A section if you've got a question for us. We're going to save some time at the end and we're going to actually answer some live Q&A. But let's jump into our daily work and what we do for a living. Uh, I, I wondered if each one of you could uh, give us, for those who haven't watched the series, uh, you know, what does the typical day in the life look like as a drywall contractor, as an electrician, as a plumber, as a carpenter? Uh, maybe give us, uh, each one of you guys, take a couple of minutes and just say kind of like, here's what a typical day looks like from you, including even like what time you get up, uh, what you're doing the night before to prep for the next day's work, some of that kind of stuff. Lydia, would you would you kick us off? Yeah, sorry. Of course, when I get right on here, the dogs have to come over and get pets. So Ava's <laughs> Ava's right under me, and she's not leaving me alone. So <laughs> you see, if you see a big fluffy tail, that's Ava. Um, <laughs> yeah. So my day usually starts. I get up about six six thirty. Um, I take my son to school in the morning first thing. Check emails. Check my calendar, of course, to see what's going on. I think we all probably live off of our our calendars on our phones. Um, and then I check the website. I check our website to see if there's any leads, any emails. Um, anything coming up, any bookings for estimates. And then I go to work. And um, like today was a texture day. So typically um, yesterday we got everything prepped. So yesterday was scrape floors, sweep, mask windows, sand everything, touch up. Um, and usually we roll right into texture after that. But it was about 4.30, I think, when we were done with that. So we decided to texture today. So this morning we got everything ready. And then texture days are very hot and sweaty because you have to close everything up. So we use a big Titan speed flow and spray um, thin down mud over everything. So it makes it really humid. So uh, uh, and then you're just running for about two hours because you can't stop once you start. So um, that's that's a texture day. Those are the worst days. They're the messiest and the longest, but they're also incredibly rewarding. Um, and then some days are, you know, you just have to go out and go do a bid. And then some days you jump from job to job because we also have another job right now out in three forks that we're doing. So that's about 45 minute drive. So we're trying to split our time between that one and then the duplex unit that we have to get done too. So some days are you start, you know, eight o'clock on a job and then you're leaving by noon and then you're going to your other job too and kind of splitting your time. So it all just kind of depends on our workload at the time. That's interesting, Lydia. I, I'm hearing you say that really every day is different, number one. Yes. I'm hearing you say that I suspect uh, you're able to, for the most part, really fit in family commitments as well. Uh, you know, I heard you say you yes. took your son to school, which is really interesting and cool about your job. I also inferred this, I don't know if this is entirely true, but that some days are shorter days and some are longer days, where there might be some days where you're really kind of done with what you need to do at noon, and then other days you may need to work late uh, into the, you know, dinner hours or later because you're trying to get something prepped and ready for tomorrow. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, sometimes, especially on texture days, there's been times when we've had to get two units done and we're working until eight 30 or nine o'clock. Wow. So it really all just depends on the job deadlines, what you have going on. Um, you know, when we were, when we first started, we did, um, Ryan and I did a whole fourplex units, they were probably about uh, 600 boards in two weeks. So that's a ton. So we were doing all of that by ourselves. So that we, we kind of had to step away from that because we literally were working Monday through Sunday. Sundays, we sometimes would work until two or three o'clock in the morning because you've got four guys coming in and they're not stopping. Wow. So it's like, OK, well, we have to get this done. We have no option and they're going to come in and lay the floors whether we're done or not. That's so um, that is definitely a tricky part is time management, especially getting into jobs that are maybe too big for you at the time, which we've done plenty of times with jobs that, you know, like, yeah, that's great. The money is great. And then you get into it and you're like, I'm working, you know, 75, 80 hours a week. What the heck am I doing right now? <laughs> and then you kind of have to reevaluate and adjust and be like that. That really was not worth the money. Yeah, I can see that. Put a pin in that thought because I'm going to come back later. And one of the questions I'm going to ask all of you guys later in the webinar is like, what what could people expect to make in your trade kind of starting out in maybe the first year, maybe in the first couple years? 
and then maybe more like mid and later years, you know, you've been doing it for 10 years. Cause I'm, I'm going to ask you about that specifically, Lydia, but let's move on to CJ. CJ, what's, what's a typical day in the life uh, look like for you as an electrician and not just an electrician, but for you also as a business owner? Yeah, well, th that's like a double edged sword, right? So business owner changes the day a little bit. Um, but I mean, starting from the trade end, it's, it's like anybody else. It's an early morning. Most of the time, I think every trade is, you know, you're at the job site early when it opens. Um, the best part about that is it's a different commute every day. I mean, for the most part, I mean, we're in a, a residential electric, uh, electrical contractor. And so, um, you know, even a big home, we're not on a job site for more than I'd say a month. Uh, I mean, that'd be a long one. Um, obviously that changes and it varies if you're, you know, commercial or residential, but I I've always loved that fact that, you know, we're not going to the same place every single day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely, the commute to the office is more, more and more, um, something that I do as a business owner. Um, so I'm not necessarily jumping on a job site really early, but the flexibility is also really nice. Um, you know, being able to, to have a different schedule during the week and not have the, that, you know, that grind you always hear about and, and having that, you know, we're looking at the clock and hoping to add hours to the day versus, you know, you go to some jobs and they're like, yeah, it makes the day go by fast. And I always thought that's funny because in the trades is not like that. You're staring at the clock or the sun and uh, realizing that, uh, you know, it'd be nice to make the days a little longer. So the flexibility, I think, is or the, the change is really what I enjoy about that. Yeah, that's interesting. How about you, Zach? What's a typical day look like for you as a carpenter and, and a business owner? Um, yeah, it changes day to day what I'm based off what I'm focusing. So, um, I try to have like a office day, like yesterday I was in the office all day and today I was in the field all day and I'll do field for the rest of the week, but basically I get up like six ish, um, get the kids breakfast, et cetera, or at least the one that gets up early enough to have breakfast and I'm out the door usually by seven 30, uh, try to get try to work in a small enough radius that I'm at the job by eight. And then we work, um, you know, typically I try and stay on one job whenever I can. Occasionally I'll jump around, but uh, uh, because of the traffic where I work, I try to stay on one job um, as much as possible. And then um, usually doing some sort of either management of the project um, or, or physical tools on. So today we were doing a deck and we had a trial day for a new apprentice carpenter. So sort of working along a, a new crew while managing the demolition crew that was happening. And then we cut the whole deck framing package for an upper deck, uh, me and the the new guy. Um, and it was just, you know, uh, first warm day in New Jersey, first like sun. And that's one of the things I love is the variation of where we're working um, to CJ's point, but also just that that appreciation of the weather and you know i was i was sweating and i was like oh I, you know i haven't done this in so long i'm taking layers off and uh I, you know i think it's it's great to be sort of more attuned with the environment and i love that part of the job and then um for 12 o'clock every day half hour lunch break we got microwaves in the in the trailer and uh everyone sits down and we sort of chat and then we're out of there uh, most days at 4.30 and I'm home uh, at five and play with the kids for an hour and we do dinner at pretty much 6.15 every night and then I do bedtime and and then oh, about two nights a week I will jump back on it and work late but I try and only do that seldomly That's awesome. and then just do that again that wasn't you know I've certainly uh, that wasn't the case always, but that's that's what I'm doing now. And I don't really see myself being able to work to hit breakfast and dinner um, with my kids in, in many jobs because most people where I live commute to Manhattan and that really um, hampers your schedule. Cool. It's tough to make that commute and be there for meal times. Well, that's for sure. Uh, I, uh, as a side note, my family also eats dinner really every night at 6.15 and my kids have been trained now that my kids are older now, they're all teenagers. Um, but we love that time where every night I make sure that I'm home on time, uh, that, you know, my wife and I decide who's making dinner, but we always have it ready at 615. And that's such a great thing that I've loved about our trade is that really uh, only with the last couple of years I've had to do videos and travel. Prior to that, I did zero travel for years and never once 
uh, missed a morning breakfast or a more or a nighttime dinner on time. So that's one of the huge benefits I think of uh, being in the trades. Eric, what's a uh, what's a typical schedule look like for you? Well, these days kids aren't at home anymore. They're all grown up and doing their own thing yep. for the most part when they're off at college. Uh, a lot of my days are figured out either days in advance or maybe sometimes just the day before utilize a um, software system that schedules out all my work because I, like everybody else has already said, like I'm working at multiple places all the time in a, in a single day during heating season here in Minnesota, you might see me working at three to six different properties, mm. typically doing the same kinds of uh, reactive repair service type of work because I'm in the residential space. I'm doing plumbing and heating a little bit, special in that sense where it's not just working on toilets or just working on faucets. I do a lot of heating work too. And so it's really probably the one thing that I like the most about my job is the problem solving. Uh, I love structure. I love having things scheduled. That's one of the things that's uh, really works well for me. And then just being able to put things in place with like those softwares to get me to people's houses, lots of uh, efficiency there. Uh, I, so I use a lot of technology just to kind of keep my, my week rolling and, and um, I use an answering service or some AI involved with that, all kinds of cool mm. stuff like that. But my typical day, three to four stops at, you know, in people's homes, I don't generally start uh, out on the road very early. People don't love it to have the idea of having a plumber in their house at seven o'clock in the morning. So usually I'm rolling into somebody's driveway around 9, 9.30. That's usually the typical start time for, you know, appointments if if I'm meeting somebody at their house. Um, and, and But, you know, like I said, every, very different every single day. I love that part of my job. Uh, my commute is really short. It's about 80 feet from my house to my shop because it's right here on my property. But my van ultimately is my office. Uh, I've got that set up so that I can operate out of that with either an iPad or my phone, uh, direct communication through my software system to all my people, all my customers. That's awesome. And yeah, it's great. Uh, anyone who's watched our videos, Eric, is 100% jealous of your shop space. Uh, and not only that, they're jealous of your mini truck as well, <laughs> which is not as roomy as your maxi van, but awfully darn cool. No. Uh, by the way, Eric's yeah. in his shop space. That's not a virtual background for him. I think that's literally, you're literally in the corner with uh, your van and, uh, everything in the background. It looks like you're getting prepped for the next day's work. Yeah. There's a little, there's a lot of stuff going on behind me. Sorry. It's so messy. <laughs> Love it. Uh, I want to read you guys a quote from Micro and get your reaction to this. A slightly longish quote, so so hang on for just a minute, y'all. This is going to take me a minute or two to read, but I want to get the four of you's reaction to this and see what you agree with that Mike says or what you don't. Uh, and if you don't know him uh, or anyone watching this who doesn't know it, he, Mike had this awesome show called Dirty Jobs on TV for a long time where he went out and did all kinds of different jobs, some of them trade, uh, licensed trade jobs, some of them not. Uh, and just worked with all kinds of different people. So he's an interesting guy in that he's literally been in the field with all kinds of different people What in, in experiencing what they do for a living. And so in talking to a group of high schoolers, I wrote this quote down and Mike said, in my opinion, you all have been given some terrible advice. This is talking to high schoolers, remember? And that advice is this, follow your passion. Every time I watch the Oscars, I cringe when some famous movie star with a trophy in their hand starts to deconstruct the secret to their success. It's always the same thing. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't have what it takes, kid. And then, of course, the ever popular, never give up on your dreams. Look, I understand the importance of persistence and the value of encouragement, but who tells a stranger to ne never give up on their dreams without even knowing what they're dreaming of? How can Lady Gaga po possibly know your pa what your passion will lead you to? And have these people never seen American Idol? I thought this this part's great. Year after year, thousands of America, thousands of aspir aspiring American idols show up with great expectations, only to learn that they don't possess the skills they thought they did. We've all seen Simon just absolutely destroy people who thought they could sing, right? That's what that that's where that quote comes from. What's really amazing though is not their lack of talent. The world is full of people who can sing. It's their genuine shock of being rejected. The incredible realization that their passion and their ability had nothing to do with each other. 
Look, if we're talking about your hobby, by all means, let your passion lead you. But when it comes to making a living, it's easy to forget this dirty truth. Just because you're passionate about something doesn't mean you won't suck at it. <laughs> and just because you've earned a degree in a chosen field doesn't mean you're going to find your, quote, dream job. Dream jobs are usually just that, dreams. But their imaginary existence just might keep you from exploring careers that offer a legitimate chance to perform meaningful work and develop a genuine passion for the job that you already have. Because here's another dirty truth. Your happiness on the job has very little to do with the work itself. On Dirty Jobs, his TV show, he says, I remember a very su successful septic, clank, septic tank cleaner who was a multimillionaire who told me the secret to his success. I looked around to see where everyone else was headed, he said, and then I went in the opposite way. Then I got good at my work. Then I began to prosper. And then one day I realized I was passionate about people's crap. I heard that same basic story from welders and plumbers and carpenters and electricians, HVAC professionals, other skilled tradesmen who followed their opportunity, not necessarily their passion at the time. And they ended up prospering as a result. He goes on to tell some more stories, but I think that's a, a great part uh, to end with and get your reaction to that. I'm going to start with you, Eric. Uh, you know, what do you think about this quote? Do you think there's some truth in that? Or do you think that there's maybe some parts that he's off on that? No, I think he's, I think he's on, uh, on point there. I look back to when I started in the trade, I was in engineering college. I was doing fine. I just was realizing at a very young age, 18, 19 years old, I graduated high school when I was 17. So I was in college by 18 and it just, I learned early on. It wasn't for me. So I'm so thankful, but I didn't know what was, I can tell you dial it way back your passion your dream job i wanted to be an nhl hockey player and i barely i barely made it through varsity hockey in a in a hockey town here in minnesota so like that wasn't gonna happen and and so you know looking back i don't know that there's no way i would have said plumbing was gonna be my passion yeah. it turns out i really like what i do and i found a niche within my trade and it's great every day and it just i i honestly can say this i think most days are better than the previous days. I really like my job a lot. That's awesome. How about you, uh, Eric? I mean, uh, not Eric. We just heard from Eric. How about you, uh, Zach? What do, what do you think about that quote? What's your What's your thoughts on that? Uh, my first My first takeaway is sort of um, this general genuine disappointment I have. People like Michael have to say things like that because um, the reason being a plumber or a drywall installer or a tile setter is not considered a dream job is because of the bad branding and the blue collar stigma we've associated with this. In other countries, yep. it is it is viewed from, from everyone as a real trade in a career that's worth uh, doing and being paid for. So like that, I just wanna acknowledge that. And it took, it took a while when I started um, and I'll be candid here. I actually came from an educated family and I wanted to drop out of school. I was, I was uh, out of college. Uh, my mom was a professor, so I was going there for free, but I was remodeling. And I actually went to a therapist to sort of coach me through that process of being okay leaving because I was like, everyone, everyone was saying, you're going to engineering. I was getting grades. What's your backup? What's your backup plan, Zach? You don't want to just finish? What about, you know, it'd be nice to have that backup, backup, backup. Wow. And I was like, I never want to, I never want to do this. I, I have zero interest in, in being an engineer. And there are certainly times in my career where I've struggled, mostly financially, where I thought, wow, it'd be great to have that education uh, or that, you know, vacation pay or that stability or what have you. But um, in general, like that's how bad the stigma is that I, I had to seek like mental health professionals to be like, hey, this is what I want to do. And I'm just confirming this is the right choice because everyone is telling me this is the wrong choice. Mm -hmm. And it took me 20 years till now I have some credibility and people are like, hey, it looks like looks like that was a good idea. Right. Like yeah. it seems yeah. to be doing great. Right. <laughs> but there was no one there the first first 10 years for sure. Um That's that was, you know, singing my praises. So I think he's on to something. And um I think one of the great things about social media is 
you do get a more personal inside look at at watching Lydia work and she's she's having fun and she's being physical and she's extremely competent in this series you showed just how difficult it was and like I could I could tape a room no problem I've done it dozens of times but literally I would get 50% of the mud on the floor and I could I could sand it to look decent but you know there there's no profitability there and um, I, I just think it's a different world and we have come a long way and Mike did a lot for that and Bill is doing a lot for that, but we still have so far to go when you compare us to, you know, pro, you know, mostly like I would say countries in U certain countries in Europe where they really educate the trades properly. Let me comment on that real quick, Zach, and then I'm going to move on to, uh, Lydia and CJ to answer this. But when I visited, uh, the real international builder show it was called the Bal show in Germany a couple of years ago. Uh, I was shocked by how I saw groups of men and women in full uniforms. They looked like they were pit, uh, pit. Uh, what am I trying to say? Like pit crew at an F1 crew, race, yeah. and and they had mascot brand workwear on a lot of them, and they would have like Hans's plumbing or you know uh, Lydia's painting or Lydia's drywall like patch on the logo, and the other one was like you know I'm trying to think of some funny German names. I can't even think of some Hans. Let's call him. You know right and. Four or five people, men and women, all from, you know, 20 to 50 walking around together. Well, they, they were a, a plumbing company and they look like pit racing crews, like all dressed. And that was their that was their dress uniform that they normally wear to work and they wore it to the trade show. And it just showed that that value that I think some of those countries really place in that. And I want to I'm, I'm seeing that come back. It's one of the reasons why I love that we all wear the build logo. Uh, you know, that logo says to me that we take pride and we take uh, passion to the job every day. We bring it with us. We bring our best. And I, I hope that the five of us here are, in our small way are bringing that professionalism back to the trades. I mean, when people see your videos, see you guys on social media, see you having even joking and having fun on the job site, uh, I think that brings a, a sense of, uh, you know, Maybe I don't necessarily have to get a professional degree uh, and become a doctor to uh, to be proud of what I do for a living. And maybe uh, maybe there are other career paths and passions that are just as professional and just as uh, high integrity as some of the other things that we were pushing on uh, young people for so many generations. CJ, what's your uh, what's your take on the on the micro quote? I think he hits it pretty good. Um... I do think everyone's scenario is different, um, you know, where you grow up, who you grow up with. Um, I was lucky. Uh, my parents, um, you know, my generation, I graduated in 2005. I'm 37 and I started in the trades at 17. Hmm. Um, I thought I wanted to build hot rods. We kind of went over that during the series. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, once you're in certain industries, you can change your mind. But um, my generation, it was definitely rammed down our throats to go to college. Um, I got lucky. I grew up in a little ag town that still, the high school still had um, an agriculture program at my high school, but it's gone. Um, or most areas, it's gone. Um, so we got to take welding. We got to be exposed to some of that stuff. So it was like, they, I wouldn't necessarily say that they, you know, the, the entire uh, school was on board with promoting trades. Um, but there was a little tiny bit of it that still existed. And again, it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, so it was like you go to college and you have, you know, this these options, you know, like you said, some obvious ones, doctor, lawyer, finance. Um, but there was never any talk or any encouragement. It was just like, oh, well, if you don't make it there, you're going to be here. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, my parents didn't raise me that way. Uh, I, I grew up around some people. Again, scenario got lucky. Um, that I saw prosper in the trades and I knew it was a viable option. But again, this isn't this isn't something that the schools are promoting, um, and, and at least in most cases that I hear about. And, um, you know, and I think it goes we're, we're looking at this crazy technology change right now and AI. I don't want to get on a tangent of AI, but it's a little terrifying. And I do think that a lot of people. Uh, you know, or propose these options that they're supposed to, you know, you're going to be successful if you go to college and do this. And uh, we see and we have friends or 
friends of friends that don't necessarily graduate and have this guaranteed ticket just because they went to college. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I just wish there was a little bit more open mindedness in education um, to at least expose some of these good things. And I think that's what talking trades obviously is about. Yep. Right. Um, but um, it's pretty interesting to see. And I think seeing that shortage of tradesmen and women now, it's being talked about a lot more because we're going to we're going to feel the reper repercussions of years and years of not promoting it. Um, there's a shortage of, of, of men and women that want to build stuff. 100%. Um, and it hurts. I mean, we're paying for it in the economy, all so many things that, that are, are, um, you know, the benefactor of that. But anyways, I just, I, I think it's everyone's scenario is different. I just wish that it was proposed as an option versus in my generation. It, it necessarily was not. Um, so that's right for sure. And that's what we're promoting. Is that there, those options are out there and they're great options. I mean, I, I look at you, four amazing successful folks there and me and five and uh you know i feel like we've been very successful in life uh and a big part of that has been uh choosing a career in the trades uh, and as a side note to that this is kind of a personal note sorry lydia I'm, I'm i'm still getting you on the answer to this question but uh i just i just turned 50 about a year or so ago and i feel like i'm at this i'm at this weird stage in life where i have i've been married 25 years this summer uh I have several friends that have gone through divorces recently after being married a fairly long time and having older kids and at least one or two of the marriages, I can see that their career choices were detrimental to their marriage. I'm not saying that if you choose a particular career, it's going to kill your marriage, but one, one, uh, one pair in particular, uh, one of the, uh, people working, the career was very, very travel oriented. And it set them on a path where they had a very separate life and all kinds of things happen. My point is, I, I love hearing that you're home every night for dinner, Zach, and that you're very specific about saying dinner's at 615. I loved hearing you, Lydia, say that you take your son to school in the morning. Uh, Eric, I love watching your travels with you and your wife, Heather. Uh, he was just in Europe doing a really cool business trip. Uh, you know, I feel like life and success is more than just how much money you make and what you have in your bank account and i really think that a career in the trades can lead you to a very successful life and a successful family i don't think we talk about that enough in america we're we're hesitant to talk about how families are a good thing but they really are for the fabric of america families are great things and trade careers can lead to really good family life i'm not saying there aren't divorced tradesmen and women don't get me wrong but it can be the basis for a really good, stable, happy life, uh, successful life, and a great marriage with great kids. Um, Lydia, what's your reaction to the micro report? I'm curious what what you what you thought as I was reading that. Yeah, definitely. So I grew up around trades. My dad is a drywall contractor. So for me, I think I always it was always there. It was always around. Um, was I necessarily proud of what my dad did? And that's kind of a, a touchy subject, hmm. too, because, you know, when you're in school and you're in high school, like the last thing you want to do is be like, yeah, my dad's blue collar, because at that point in time, it wasn't really looked on as like a great job or a good job. Sure. It's more kind of like, oh, your dad's blue collar. Like even me as an adult, when I would go to kids events, I would be like, I make sure I didn't I was I was clean and cleaned up and like made sure no one knew what I did. And right. when I would tell them, they'd be like. There's no way that you do that. And I'm like, yeah, actually I do. <laughs> but it's it's definitely starting to change. Like when I've been at events for my kids, I see a dad come in and he's obviously just got off work. And it's like, man, I, I love that you're taking the time to make your kids a priority, yes. make, you know, showing up to these events a priority, regardless yes. of how you look. Yeah. And I really feel like we all need to start changing our mindset about how we look at blue collar and how we look at trades. And I think people just think of it as like, you're dirty, it's the last resort, it's the last option. You couldn't do well at school, so therefore you had to go the, the loser route or whatever it may right. be. But yeah, it's so <laughs> much. Uh, the dogs are talking. <laughs> no problem. Right, right. So, I mean, it's, it's always a backup, right? I yeah. mean, it's always, uh, or at least it's presented that way. I think yeah. it's the presentation. I mean, yeah. I just see my generation. I feel like it's presentation. Yep. And um, yeah, that's right. I don't want to sound naive, but I think we're seeing a, a, a shift a little bit. I really do. I know it's easy to look at through the lens of social media and because you're fed things that are 
you're like-minded, you know, that are in your wheelhouse already or in your interest. But I, I see people talking about a different, I have two boys um, that are 21 and 23 and they both work um, labor trade type jobs in the summer. They're going to school because that's where their strengths lie. Mm -hmm. uh, as they were exiting high school, uh, trades were always a part of what was available to them. I grew up in a trades fan. I was going to be the first one that graduated college at the time and I dropped out. Right. Mm -hmm. But like, I think people are changing their minds a little bit. I think it is, it, it's shifting um, because of people like CJ and Lydia and Zach and everybody else that's putting content out there that people are watching, whether yeah. it's on YouTube or yeah. build show network or social media. Yeah. I think there is a certain amount of day in the life that people are frankly fascinated with. Uh, you know, I really enjoy following all four of you. And if, if you're watching this, you're not following these guys on Instagram. You should. I, I think some of the daily content, which is just Eric driving around in his van or Zach, I heard you talking yesterday uh, in your garage shop, uh, lamenting about uh, having office time and how you'd much rather be a carpenter in the field. Uh, and and I just really resonated with that. And, and actually, I wanted to talk about that for a minute. Uh, and I'll start with you, Zach, because you were the one that kind of brought it up to the, to the forefront of my mind. Uh, you're really kind of a three person company at this stage, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, how, how um, what, what is it about your trade that you like in terms of actually the hands-on work versus the owning the business side? Because it's, it's, a, it's a topic I want to talk about a little bit because there's lots of different paths. And as a side note, Zach's kind of a three-person company. Uh, Eric's kind of a one-point something company. Uh, where his wife works in the business part-time, but not full-time. And then he also sometimes pulls other people in to help on jobs. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Lydia, if I remember correctly, you're still kind of a two-person company. Uh, and CJ, you're like five or six now, something like that. Is that generally accurate? Yeah, I got five guys in the field and me in the office, yeah. Okay. So, so let's talk for a minute about that kind of um, what I would consider bags on, where you're actually working in your trade versus running a business. Can you give me any like percentage of time? And for each one of your four trades, particularly, is there a path that you could take for someone listening who could go one way or another with that trade? In other words, could, could you, Zach, and I, I kind of know the answer to this because I kind of do that. Could you be just a remodeling contractor and never have bags on, which is kind of me. I'm about 50 remodel, 50 new construction. I'm not a great carpenter. I, I never really have had bags on. But I'm curious, from your perspective, if it was ideal for you, would you be 100% in the field as, as a tradesman or would you be moving towards uh, really just being a business owner? Yeah, the, unfortunately, the answer to that question, I don't know um, <laughs> because it's it all kind of interests me, you know, getting better interests yeah. me. Yeah. So when you bring up the micro quote about the septic contractor being interest, you know, enjoying poop, right? I almost feel that way about spreadsheets. Like when I had to learn how to do that in college, I hated it. But now because it makes me money and it gets me back in the field, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, this is so cool. I went on Reddit and I learned this new trick, which saves me two hours a week. So that gets me into the field and maybe it makes me a little bit of extra money. I can buy that tool I want. That's so, so cool. A great example. The patch for weird things shows up. And for me, it was, you know, the reverse. I was already interested in the trades. Now I'm interested in the business side. But um, where I would ideally be is probably uh, four days in the field, one day in the office. I do three days in the field and two days in the office because of the amount of media production that take is happening in my business right now. Um, which is probably similar for a lot of the folks in here. Mm -hmm. We have a slightly different schedule because of, you know, what we're doing to sort of videotape and chronicle our lives a bit. But um, if it weren't for that, I'd well, be Zach four also one. is a superstar besides just Build Show Network because he's filming this old house currently. I think we're okay to uh, to say that, right? Because uh, your season's yeah, been the cat's uh, out of the bag. The, the cat's out <laughs> of the bag. Your season's already started, but. I'm sure this old house watched you on the Build Show Network and was like, this guy's amazing. He should be our builder for our next project. I mean, he looks like 
he's been doing this for 50 years. I do. I do have to gig you a little bit. The first episode, I was a little I was a little upset that they made fun of your age, Zach. And, and they pretended like they were asking you to go get coffee. I was like, come on, guys, seriously, you're crushing me here. Yeah. Zach's an amazing business owner and carpenter. I don't, I don't, I didn't like that. Just because I'm so youthful looking. <laughs> you are, you are a youthful 57. I gotta say that is definitely true. Very, very youthful. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know to answer that question. Like it's, it's, it's tough because in general, I feel like the, our industry doesn't pay blue, blue collar people enough. Yep. So there's this, it's, it's necessary to be doing the office work when a lot of us, the reason I feel like the trades have such a bad rap is because there's so many of us running horrible businesses because we're not business minded, yeah. right? Yeah. We're horrible at this. We have no interest in this, but it is necessary. Like I can't just go get a carpentry job that gives me the type of benefits and lifestyle I want in my area. No one does that. Right. So I, so I started a business. My, my previous employer basically said, you're never going to make enough money to survive working for me, start a business. So that's what I did. I shouldn't have done that. I'm not a business minded person, but um, I went ahead and lost money for years and years and years until I made enough st mistakes to say like, all right, like, I guess I'm a businessman now. Cause I have children, <laughs> but, uh, but I also like how you're like, you know, spreadsheets are actually not that bad and I kind of like them. And so, yeah. uh, you know, the Excel spreadsheet is the poop for you from the micro <laughs> quote. And you're like, well, actually I, I kind of am passionate about poop. I mean, spreadsheets <laughs> and poop and poop. <laughs> CJ, how about you? How much time do you spend in the field, uh, as a master electrician versus business owner these days? Um, well, I'm in the same boat. I feel like a lot of trades men and women, and you know, when you start a business out of the trades, I was tradesman first and business came second. So I'm in the same boat as Zach, uh, where, you know, yet I had to learn a lot by mistake. Um, and so I have hired a business coach, <laughs> a Good. business consultant Good. actually recently. They're on the build show BTA. Yep. And um, I get a lot out of them. And, and he would say I need to be uh, bags off more. Um, I'm passionate. I like my bags on. Um, I, I'd say I'm like four weeks bidding and running the jobs, like no bags on and one to two when I need to pick up the slack uh, in the field. I wish it was more. I don't know if it'll realistically ever be that. But the option is there, right? I do yeah. love being yeah. in the field. I feel so energized when I'm in the field with the guys even though they laugh at me most of the time, they're all better than me as electricians now. Um, you know, it's 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 tough. I do enjoy spreadsheets too, and I did not in school. And I ended up in the trades because I didn't necessarily love sitting in a classroom. But I will find myself on Google or on, on YouTube learning, you know, cells and formulas to make uh, better spreadsheets. So, you know, the business <laughs> stuff's fun. Um, I, I think it just comes with the way my brain works and having a little mix of both. Yeah. Um, I wish I was in the field more, but again, there's not enough days in the week to do both. And I got to, I, I got to focus. And so, um, it's a lot more managing the business, um, working on my business than, um, in my business, you know? Gotcha. Um, Lydia, you kind of alluded to this at the, at the top of the program when we were talking about your typical day. It sounds like you tend to do a little bit of, uh, kind of office hours in the morning first thing and get that taken care of and then you are hands-on for some period of the day uh and then you come back to the office at night is that is that accurate am i saying that correctly yeah so it's usually morning stuff for like about an hour drink some coffee answer emails check my calendar that sort of stuff but i am very hands-on so it's only ryan and i so drywall is a little tricky you can go big oh my goodness i'm sorry the dogs are just really wanting to have a, a <laughs> lot of attention today and we had a ups delivery of course he usually doesn't get here until like seven so i'm like what the heck are you doing here now um anyway um we're very hands-on and drywall is a little different because it's hard to make employ it's hard to make money unless you are bidding huge jobs and I've seen it over and over and over again with guys. They they get these jobs and they get like four or five employees, six employees. They're not making any more than they were just on their own with just two of them. Mm -hmm. And then they have all of this added stress of finding the work, keeping your employees busy, making sure everybody's trained, 
then trying to fix all the stuff that they messed up. So for us, it was just, we have such a great system. We're effective. We work efficiently. We make money. Um, it was like, we didn't really need to grow. And I think that's something too, that you kind of have to look at when you are starting to blue collar, like, or you're, you're starting in, you know, your own, um, you know, contracting business or whatever, what are your goals? Yeah. Are your goals? I want to grow as big as I can and be on these multi-million commercial jobs and have, you know, 50 crews, or do I want to be, you know, it's just me. It's just another person that I can trust and we do our best job that we can and we just keep it small and we bid correctly and we make money off of it. So yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of options when it comes down to it. And I think that that really comes down to, do you want to be more of a business owner or do you want to be still hands on bags on and still be doing the work and enjoy the work? Yeah. And I really, really enjoy my job. So for me, it's an easy, it's an easy answer. Like, I don't want to be in that management side. I don't want to be running, you know, 10 guys. I want to be able to go do my work, have fun with it and then go home. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eric, you're last up. And I, and I think, um, I think I generally assume that you work alone most days. Is that true? Uh, and, uh, I'm curious, I'm sure you had an inflection point in your, in your career where, you switched from being an employee and being somewhat hourly as a plumber. And you, a lot of plumbers make really good hourly wages to you saying, you know, I think I'm going to take the risk, uh, to Ani plumbing. Uh, you know, do you ever regret that? And how much of your time do you spend working your, by yourself versus with other people? Uh, I don't regret it for a minute, but it did take me, uh, I'll just go through a real quick timeline. Uh, first 10 years, because I had what I, I read a book one time about it. I forget the author. and I'd love to share that, but it was, uh, I had what was called an entrepreneurial seizure. I decided I was a really good mechanic and I was making the boss a lot of money. And I thought I'm going to do that. And that's pretty much the most familiar story for anybody yep. in the trades. Yep. Uh, really easy to do when you're in like a, a licensed trade, like a plumbing, electrical, that kind of thing. And it's, there's a really clear path on how you go about starting a business in these trades. Uh, it took me 10 years to figure out I wasn't making the money I thought I was. Took me another five years to learn how to run my business. And then, so I'm at like the 15 year mark. And that's when I started using things like uh, what I thought was like super expensive software to manage customers, manage jobs, bookkeeping, all kind of tied together. Uh, fast forward another five years where we're at now. And that's what runs my business is very, in, very little off. time spent daily or weekly on the business as far as just organizing things. It's really um, a lot of customer interaction over the phone, emails, that kind of thing. So I kind of do that daily. And then, so yeah, I don't regret it a bit. It took me a long time to figure out what I was doing and how to get any better or learn more, or figure out what I needed to learn to make things better. But, you know, spending time on the business or spending time in the tools, I'm on the tools almost every single day. I'm like Zach where I have to dedicate at least a day. So usually Mondays are my... Uh, unscheduled days and that allows me to take care of the stuff you do have to take care of whether it's like restocking my van ordering materials or just literally getting rid of scrap water heaters or things like that like there's th that's on the job right that's re really daily stuff you got to do uh, I kind of push that off to a Monday thing because over the weekend in my business calls come in mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times people want to wait they don't want to pay you know emergency rates things like that so I very much enjoy working in the business because I can spend very little time working on the business. I'm not looking to expand. This is, I should take that back. This is the year where we are talking about having one plumber come in, but you know, working in Minnesota, we have strict uh, licensing rules, things like that. So I'm going to have to hire somebody that's licensed and ready to go. Right. And yep. so yep. that's a big step for me, but it's not because I want to spend any more time in my office. That's not what I enjoy doing. Uh, Heather is a professional bookkeeper. Uh, she's my wife. She's really good at telling me uh, things that I'm doing wrong and, and helping me fix them. And that's what, you know, she's good at. I'm good at, you know, the other things. And together, I think it's a pretty good combination. That's really good. Well, I got you, Eric. I'm going to have you be the first one to answer my next question, which will probably take us to uh, about the end here. Uh, what can an 18 to, you know, 25 year old, let's say, who's new on the job site, 
and is working for a plumbing company, working either as an apprentice or thinking about an apprenticeship, uh, I'm going to ask you four, four, four ranges. Like, what could they expect to make? And, and of course, you may not know the whole country, or you might because you are pretty well connected in the kind of zero to one, like the first the first time they step on a job. And then maybe after they have some experience, maybe one to three years, and then maybe five to 10 years, and then 10 years plus, especially for your trade, thinking they've got, you know, let's say a master plumbing license. And I'm thinking that they're working for another shop, uh, not necessarily a business mm -hmm. owner. Uh, can you give us any ranges of what the hourly pay or yearly pay might look like for those four ranges? Yeah, so in the Twin Cities area, I can speak to that more specifically, but generally speaking, first year, uh, apprentice plumber in Twin Cities or, you know, upper Midwest, let's say, you're looking at 20 to $22 an hour plus benefits. And so not a bad wage at all for starting. Now, I know you can go and make sandwiches for 15 to 16, but that's, there's a limit there. There's an end yeah, game there, right? right? Um, you're looking at two, you know, third and fourth year apprentices making any, you know, looking at like a 10% increase each year. Um, you're looking at probably forty to fifty thousand dollars your second or third year into your apprenticeship. Uh, turning out as a licensed plumber in uh, I know for sure in the Minneapolis area, anywhere from eighty to one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year. It's pretty standard depending on if you work union, non-union, if you're doing new construction service, that kind of thing. Wow. Um, I, I could say that if you live in an area of the country where uh, licensing is mandated for our trade, which is most a everywhere, pretty right? big portion of yeah most everywhere not everywhere though not everywhere um that's a huge benefit for our trade and for the worker and the business owners because you've got high wages you're you're out there doing high levels of work you're working with competent people well trained and well you know continuing education all that stuff is in play so the wages are reflected in that too and um like i said licensed trade in my area licensed plumbers I don't know. Most of my friends that are licensed in Minneapolis are making any less than about 100 to 120 grand a year. Yeah. And so if so, if people are really concerned, looking at the money aspect of it, it's not a bad, you know, it's a really good, pretty good shot. And and on the high end of that, you know, you own a you own a shop and you have several plumbers working for you. I've got a friend of mine who's who's my age. Actually, he's probably a couple years younger than me. He probably has around 50 plumbers at his uh, shop. He's doing new construction. Uh, he's doing something ridiculous, like 2,000 new homes a year. And I don't know what he oh. makes, but I can tell you it's in the seven figures plus. Uh, and he has, oh, yeah. he's doing very, very well for himself financially. And he is not bags on at all. <laughs> but he started 100% oh. in the ditch as a 19 year old. And so he's a pretty, I mean, he's, He's like you, man. I, I said it when I was with you, and it's one of my favorite quotes from the series that you are a great American success story built on the plumbing trade, Eric. And I'm really proud of, of you and the life that you built for you and your family. And I think that you're an amazing model of someone who took your trade and said, I want to get good at this, and I'm going to be successful. And you have absolutely done it, man. I'm, I'm so thankful for you, Eric, and, and thanks for answering that question. Let's move on to, thanks, uh, man. Let's move on to Zach. Zach, as a carpenter, uh, you're in a higher wage area, I suspect, being outside of New York City and New Jersey there. But give us those same ranges of like, what would what would, uh, you know, uh, what would a Kalen make, which is your your guy coming in with really no experience to saying, hey, I'm interested in becoming a carpenter. I want to help on the job to get to that point. Give us kind of zero to one, three to five, five to ten and maybe ten plus. Can you give us those ranges? Sure. Um, I'll caveat all this with saying that, you know, it's 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 a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, there's a there's a workman's compensation bounty on tradespeople who have higher risks like glazers, roofers, carpenters, people who, who could hurt themselves more, yeah. have a bigger rate. It's a good point. And so, yeah that's going to stamp down your earnings a little bit because your employer's paying for that. But I would say you're going to start at the 20 to $22 with little to no skills. Um, if you can be um, competently left alone to do simple tasks, you can probably be about 25 to 
uh, 26, we'll say, once you've got, you know, soft skills dialed in um, and, you, you know, you can really, com you know, complete things in a reasonable time and be profitable, then you're, you're over 30. And um, I have, uh, I can't speak to them as employees, but I have um, sub trades that I work with that maybe focus on cabinet install, for example, I've got a cabinet installer that works for me. He bills me at $98 per hour. So he's making um, about $170,000 a year if he's working 52 weeks a year. Um, you know, I'm, maybe I'm not factoring his overhead and all that. You know, he's got to pay comp out of that. So that's not all, all the money he's making. But, um, you know, I, I it's certainly over over six figures if you focus. One of the problems that I have as a remodeler is we do a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to get really efficient like like Lydia is with, with her trade. Ours is very disparate, different house, different architecture. But um, certainly um, if, you are, if you are efficient, you will make a very good living. Yeah, for sure, that's good. How about you, Lydia? Someone coming into uh, the drywall uh, trade and wants to learn the trade. Uh, you know, you were a little different as a as a young apprentice because you'd actually worked quite a bit in your teen years with your dad. With your dad, so maybe not you as an example because uh, you had way more experience than any other eighteen year old coming in. But what what would someone today uh, would you say in that in those same four ranges be uh, be thinking that they could make on an hourly basis? Yeah, so I'd say probably around 17 to 20, maybe starting, maybe a little bit less, depending on your area. Um, drywall is tricky because some areas drywall is very cheap and some areas like where I am, it's very high end and expensive. So I would say here, I'd probably start to about 17 to 20. It would probably upgrade like, because most of the time you find people want to quit within three months. I don't know if you guys all have the same thing, but there's kind of like that number and you kind of get to it and you're like, all right, are you staying? Or are you going? Because mm. they've either had enough of it or they're sick of doing the, the menial stuff and they're like, peace. So I probably start to about 17 to 20. Um, you will start making money, like making me money, um, probably about after a year, a year and a half to where I'm not having to babysit you. So then you would bump up to about 25. Um after about five years, you could be making around, you know, 60 to 80, somewhere around there. Um, and that's usually the time where people leave. About three to five years is when you usually start your own business. Mm -hmm. um, drywall is a little different. There's a lot of self-employed drywallers. There's not a lot of guides that stay on with companies for long times because once you know, you know when you start your own business. Um, and then we make over six figures a year. So depending on what you're wanting to do and how high end you're getting and, and some of the jobs you're getting into, um, like I was talking to a local plaster artisan and he's bidding jobs at, you know, almost half a million dollars for, for plaster work. So it kind of depends on which road you want to go down, how much money you can make because there's a lot. But I would say after about, you know, about eight years, you should be at the six figure mark and bidding your own jobs and having your own work is a big part of that, too. That's wild, Lydia. I mean, think about that. You could be going from an 18 year old to a late 20 year old making six yeah. figures, zero college debt. Uh, and from what it sounds like, your day to day is different every day. It's totally varied. Uh, you know, you work hard, but man, what a what a cool way for an 18 year old. Uh, to make a great living and make a great career. Um, I think so, that's the great thing about the trades. It's endless. Yeah. You can make it whatever you want to make it. Yeah, for I sure. mean, you really, the sky's the limit when it comes to it. Do you want to stay small and, and niche, or do you want to go big and bid huge jobs and you know manage a, manage a big company? Where's your? You can be in the trades and also be a business owner. Yeah, I love that. You, you and Ryan have done such a great job of bringing – uh, an incredible face to the drywall industry that I think has really been needed, Lydia. Uh, and I think it's yeah. so fun that people that you have such a giant Facebook and Instagram following. I think people uh, absolutely love watching you work. You're so well spoken. Uh, your curly hair always looks great on camera. You're all you look like you're really enjoying it, and you're at such a such a master position after doing it so long that you just make it look so effortless. And so easy. And what I realized in working with you is like, man, this is a job that requires some muscle too. I mean, you're throwing some calories around on the, like you're doing a CrossFit workout for hours at a time every day on the job site. I mean, moving, 
heavy stuff around, carrying heavy stuff, and doing it with such grace and with such eloquence. I'm so proud to, uh, to have you shooting videos on our network. You're amazing. Uh, oh, it's great. And I think drywall is kind of like that as a dirty trade. Sorry, the dogs are actually being quiet so I can talk. I mean, Don't get German Shepherds if you want peace and quiet. I'm just it is a dirty right job. Now. There's no doubt about it. I mean, anyone who's ever watched any of your videos knows that you get dirty <laughs> doing drywall. Uh, but you clean yourself up and you get back after the next day. I mean, that's the beauty of America in 2024. We have really we have these amazing hot showers we can take that wash the uh, sunscreen and the sweat off and the drywall mud off every day. And it's super easy to do. Pretty amazing. CJ, how about you? Let's uh, let's wrap with you on on this question. What's uh, from your estimation? What is a early apprentice who's interested in getting electrical? And then those next couple categories, you heard us talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. You're starting over 20 bucks an hour, um, you know, with no experience. Uh, we live in a pretty affluent, I'm 40 miles from San Francisco. So we live in a pretty high end area, high cost of living. Um, and so it varies drastically, but I will say, you know, it's a five year apprenticeship, you, you know, typically before you turn out as a general journeyman. Um, and at that point, you know, you're usually a competent guy is usually got a paid van, full benefits, 401k, um, you know, gas card, and you're making six figures, you know, um, and, and then you drive over the Golden Gate Bridge and you're working in just like the East Coast and in, in San Francisco here and Manhattan there, the union wages are wild you I hear bet. you hear a uh, foreman making over a hundred bucks an hour, um, you know, and there's 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 obviously such a fluctuation because yeah. everything's different. There's residential, there's commercial, yep. uh, you know, touching on some of the fun stuff is like, you know, your technology's improving. We're, we're doing, you know, you got skills in your programming lighting systems or, you know, a frequency drive, you know, these things that you the more you add to your resume. The more valuable you are, it's a competitive, and the sky's the limit because of it, the competitiveness. Yep. So if you're worth it, you know, uh, you know, call around because because there's no real, real good guys looking for work. They are all hunkered down with someone that's paying them a boatload because, you know, the skills are hard to get. So the bigger yes. your resume, uh, the more certifications, the more, um, uh, you know, um, Continuing education, the things that you go out and you learn, you can get those check boxes on your resume. That's right. Um, That's right. You know, back to the brinks truck if you're good. Man, for the for the One. high schooler watching this, I mean, these four are a great example of work hard, gain skills, gain passion, and gain recognition. I mean, you guys, all four of you are amazing spokesmen and women for your for your industry, and I'm so thankful for you guys. I think that. Uh, all four of you have made great lives for yourself and you've really built your careers debt free too, without the four year college debt uh, that so many people come out with. Uh, you know, I can think of a friend of mine that went to school for it. He, he thought it was going to be one thing and then ended up getting just a general business degree, got a job at a rental car uh, company after college and was working in a parking garage on the bottom floor, greeting people who were getting their cars, worked in this little box every day. And I was telling him as I was in my job as an assistant superintendent, how I loved the freedom of being outside and getting sunshine and going to the, the time I had like 20 houses under construction at any one time and visiting every house and making sure people had what they need and thinking about what I was doing. And I had a job shack and I had a pickup truck and I had a cell phone, which he couldn't believe that I had a cell phone. This is the 90s, of course. Um, but I remember thinking, why did this guy waste his four years and he's paying back $100,000 plus in loans to work in the basement of a parking garage in a box? I mean, he just sounded like his job was absolutely awful. And I absolutely loved my job. And funny thing was, I bet he was making, I don't know, 20 or 30% more than me, but he hated life. <laughs> and I bet I'm making more than him now. Uh, I'd like to catch up with him again. I wonder what he's doing these days. But I know he was in that terrible job for many years before he got out of the box. So I'm super proud of you guys. Thank you for taking the time. Anybody have anything else that they want to end with or any stories or anything that we want to uh, wrap up with or anything that I missed? Can I add one thing, Matt? Please, I, I wish I would have brought it up when you asked me about the wages. Uh, I, I know that CJ is familiar with this, but apprenticeship, right? So 
when I do talk with younger uh, kids about the trades, I remind them like with my trade, we have a structured apprenticeship and there's guidelines that the state has in place that is, you know, making sure you're getting education, make sure you're protected, you're getting your wages, that kind of thing, and proper training. I think it's worth bringing up for anybody that might be thinking about going to the trades, maybe they're high school age or early college age. Look, if you want to come into a trade like plumbing, HVAC, electrical, we'll teach you everything you need to know, and you're going to make money while you're doing it. Yeah, I think that's really that's important for people. You're not. We don't expect you to know this stuff. I didn't. Took me. We have a five year apprenticeship here in Minnesota. So like, there you go. You know, I got paid no debt when I was done. I think it's worth bringing that up. Apprenticeship programs they don't get enough attention in this country. Mm -hmm. We don't have a strong system for it in most states. Not every state. Like I said, it's great here in Minnesota, and it's only getting better. I think across the country. But you don't have to graduate high school and then think like, what am I going to do? I don't want to go to college but I don't know how to do these things these people do. Well, we teach, we train you and that's yeah. the whole progression through the trade. That's huge. So amazing. Guys, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day to, uh, to talk to us. And hopefully, uh, hopefully we will all hear uh, at the grocery store from a young person who watched this and maybe even uh, a couple years into their trade will look back on us and say, you know, it was because I was watching Zach or CJ or Lydia or Eric uh, and seeing what they did on a day-to-day -day basis that I thought, you know, that looks like a really cool job. I would like to do that. I can think back to uh, to watching this old house in the 80s and thinking what a cool job that Tom Silva had. And uh, honestly, that's a big part of why I ended up being a builder because I thought at the time, like some of you guys, I heard you talk about the CJ, you want to be a hot rod builder. I wanted to work for Toyota and manufacturing. <laughs> and I started school as an engineer and realized quickly that uh, differential equations was not my friend uh, and that I needed to switch my uh, major or I was going to fail. Uh, and so I fell into home building uh, after doing it and found out, you know what, I'm really passionate about this and I'm so thankful I did. Guys, thank you for all you do. If you're not familiar with these guys, go follow them on social media. We'll have a link below here that you can catch all of their uh, social media handles. And also go watch their videos on Build Show Network dot com each one of these guys uh probably have a hundred plus videos on our network uh teaching you about their trade showing you what their day-to-day -day looks like uh these people are amazing spokesmen and women for the industry that being said guys follow us on facebook or instagram we'll see you next time on the build show i want to thank our friends at front door for sponsoring this talking trade series if you're not familiar with front door they are reimagining how homeowners maintain and repair their most valuable asset, their home. As the parent company of two leading brands, Front Door brings over 50 years of experience in providing their members with comprehensive options to protect their homes from costly and unexpected breakdowns through their extensive network of pre-qualified professional contractors. American Home Shield has approximately 2 million members and gives homeowners budget protection and convenience covering up to 23 essential home systems and appliances. Now, Front Door is a cutting edge one-stop app for home repair and maintenance. Enabled by their stream technology, the app empowers homeowners by connecting them in real time through video chat with pre-qualified experts to diagnose and solve their problems. The Front Door app also offers homeowners a range of other benefits, including DIY tips, discounts, and much more. More information about American Home Shield and Front Door, visit frontdoorhome.com. Now, as the largest provider of home service plans in the nation and a network of approximately 16,000 independent contractors, Front Door is spreading the word and advocating to bring new talent into the pipeline by creating opportunities for young people as plumbers, electricians, and other highly skilled professions. Front Door has also been sponsoring organizations committed to the advancement of the skilled trades like Skills USA and Be Pro Be Proud. And lastly, Front Door is launching a new initiative that helps students further explore the skilled trades through a trade along program. Think of it kind of like a take your kid to work day. They will experience a day in the life where they will work alongside a skilled trades professional to see firsthand what it's really like to work in that particular profession. Our hope is that this will continue to encourage young people to join us here in the trades and really fill that gap that we've got. 
of skilled trades people in the younger generation. So thank you so much Front Door for sponsoring this Talking Trade series. And hopefully you, just like the people at Front Door, can encourage that young person to get out there on the job site with you and really see what a day in life in the trades looks like. We'll see you next time. I wanna say a huge thanks to my friends at Sashco for sponsoring this Talking Trades series. First off, if you're not familiar with them, Sashco makes a huge line of premium cocks and sealants that I use every day on my high performance builds. They're a family owned company that makes their products in Colorado, but they also have been a massive supporter of trade school education. Now, if you are a trade school teacher watching this video, I wanna tell you about their class pack program, which was designed for you to use in your classroom to educate students about sealant technology and application. Now I've been through a version of this program and it was really fun and educational. You can enhance your curriculum with their expert resources. Learn more at sashco.com backslash trades support. Now, if you aren't a teacher, you can still make a difference in this battle to bolster our trade base. Take the Sashco challenge, volunteer a local trade school in your town, capture the moment, share it on social media and tag Sashco, and your reward will be a free case of Lexel as a token of their appreciation for supporting trade education. Thanks again, Sashko, for sponsoring these videos.